Let's uh, go now to Keith Pitt, the MP from North, uh, Coalition MP from Queensland. Uh, Keith, great to see you. Got the flag there and you got the Phantom comics in the background. Good man. This is what we like to see on a Sunday morning. Um, Keith, I uh, wanted to ask you a bit about this nature positive plan that I talked about last week. Uh, and this is uh, arguably the most dangerous piece of legislation uh, that has been snuck through. It's the secrecy that Labor are up to, exactly what they did with The Voice, trying to sneak it through Parliament. Can you tell us from your point of view what is happening with this nature positive uh, plan and the threat it poses basically to anyone who wants to turn over a bit of soil in, in their backyard or the paddock or wherever else? Uh, well, good morning, outsiders. Great, great to be with you. And yes, Shane Wright is actually uh, does a lot of the cartoons for the Phantom. So, and he's a local, which is which is wonderful. Excellent, good the man. The nature positive plan, it, the nature positive plan is Australian negative. Uh, that that is the problem. Uh, and a lot of this has been developed. Would you believe in late 2022, uh, and it has been kept almost top secret. There's some 37 recommendations, and and if we look at just a couple of them, uh, one is that effectively uh, cultural heritage will be everything. Uh, there'll be a national body uh, that's already been formed, to be honest, in terms of where they get their advice. Uh, and this is a state issue. It should be left with the states to look after. Another layer of regulation over the top, uh, just to deal with cultural issues, is another nail in the coffin, particularly for those big projects in the resources sector that we need to keep our economy ticking over. Uh, if you look at one of the other elements in terms of the 37, uh, we're now going to have uh, what's effectively the Green Police so you can imagine he'll be applying for that. You'll have green anarchists mm. with a badge, uh, able to stop projects and force things, uh, provide fines, do all sorts of horrible bits and pieces. And you can still delay it through the courts. Well, unless you're in Victoria and you're a wind and solar farm, <laughs> where they're changing the rules and those impacts won't be there and they're going to bypass it. But just for those types of projects, because, you know, not all projects are equal. But we, uh, you know, we need to ask the Labor Party and Tanya Plibersek, who's pushing this, you know, where, where are all these so-called endangered species? Is there a map showing us where they all are? Is there a list of endangered species? Because when I waded through the uh, lengthy um, uh, Department of Energy and Environment uh, blurb about it, uh, they're very vague on the details, exactly how many species are at risk. Uh, they, they actually boast, Keith, that there will be more and more species. They're finding more and more oh, endangered fantastic. species every day. And they haven't given any indication of actually where these endangered species are. So I've drawn up a map, Keith. I don't know if you, this is a valid one or not. But here's where I think, there it is, all of Australia. All of Australia will come under the remit of this new endangered species, unacceptable impacts, critical habitats, etc. Do you think I'm being unfair to Labor? Uh, not, not at all. I think if you look at the map, that's what will apply. But there are some exceptions, uh, and those exceptions are where you want to put big wind and solar plants because, well, they're mm. exempt. Mm. Clarks Creek, for example, in Queensland, 3,500 hectares of koala habitat, but apparently they're not impacted there. They're only impacted when you're close to the cities or somewhere where the green anarchists can show up. Uh, and in Queensland, they don't have to meet all of the existing development rules that everyone else has to. I'm, I'm told the reef regs, for example, don't apply. Uh, it's just ludicrous. Then you come back to, as I said earlier, what's happening in Victoria, where they're now going to exempt the processing uh, and planning proposals that they would apply to every other project so that it doesn't slow them down, so that those who are impacted don't have the normal routes to go and apply to courts. They've got to go to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court. So not all projects are equal. Rita. Well, is this legislation the most dangerous legislation we have seen, according to some. Is this going to pass the upper house? Where, where does it stand right now? Is this uh, going to be law by June? Oh, well, clearly they'll have the Greens' support uh, and the Greens will probably bash out something that's even worse. Uh, and then you've got <laughs> the other Greens in terms of Pocock and the other allegedly independent senators who I'm sure will support it and they'll bash out something which is even the worse. The Teals. Uh, we're waiting to see what the coalition... The Teals. We'll wait and see what the coalition position is. But you just can't keep putting regulation over regulation for the big industries that provide jobs and drive our economy and expect them to stay. And they'll keep leaving because there are other places in the world they can invest their money.
James. Keith, a huge um, fight has been brewing this week about the cost of the renewable energy transition. Um, we reported in the Daily Telegraph this week that Chris Bowen was out by at least $100 billion on his numbers for the transition to net zero. We've seen things like the Snowy 2.0 project blow out by, I think, around 12 or $13 billion thus far. And now we have CSIRO defending its gen cost report because they have been accused of miscalculating um, how much this renewable transition is going to cost. Are the wheels starting to come off this idea that this is actually going to be, you know, an economically viable idea, thing to do, and that renewables are, as Chris Bowen keeps telling us, ad nauseum, uh, the cheapest form of energy? Well, Chris Bowen is the Maxwell Smart of the federal politics. He's <laughs> missed it by that much. <laughs> it's over $100 billion. But, uh, but this is the proposition. So, I mean, f forget the economists at 10 paces and everything else. What Chris Bowen is trying to say to the Australian people is you can have two cars in your garage. You've got to borrow money for both. One will only work when the weather conditions are right. The other one will work all the time. The one that needs the weather-dependent conditions, you'll have to build all new roads for all over the place. But you don't worry about the cost of those, that doesn't count. And somehow that will be cheaper. Well, as long as my backside points to the ground, you can't build two generating systems and have it be cheaper than one. So, mm -hmm. Keith, you mentioned the, uh, James mentioned the amount that they were out, 100 billion errors. But we've also seen um, this week Chris Bowen and Anthony Albanese, I'll be talking about it later in the program, but uh, out there in Western Sydney, spruiking uh, a transport, they gave 20 million of taxpayers' dollars to a transportation company, Christine Holgate, funnily enough, her, uh, she's popped up again, um, to do EVs. Now, these, that's, that's $335,000 per truck that the Australian taxpayer is subsidising. Mm. I mean, we can't keep on subsidising this madness. Where is the money coming from, Keith? Well, it's coming from each and every one of you and every single taxpayer that's watching this program. Uh, and I can make anything work if someone else pays for it. <laughs> it <laughs> just doesn't matter. You don't need to be an economist to work that out. Uh, and these are the challenges. So it's not te technically viable right now, it's not economically viable, and that's why the big providers are simply not doing it. Uh, and I know on the resources sector they've done all of these assessments and they can't make it work. Now, does technology advance in the future? Well, who knows? Uh, but until it does, no one's going to make these changes on the grounds of engineering and economics. Uh, and then the environmental impacts down the track. What do you do with all of these batteries, which are incredibly dangerous? They burn very, very hot when there's a fire. There'll be significant challenges because currently I'm, I'm not aware of anywhere that can recycle them. And then what about the value of those assets? If you're a, a poor Australian taxpayer that buys a new car, which is battery driven, and you go to trade it in and it's worthless, well, I don't think too many people will be happy about that, uh, and particularly their bank. And Keith, just quickly before you go, what did you make of the Queensland elections yesterday? And uh, wipe the smile off Giggle's face this morning, was it? Well, uh, Premier Giggles Miles has got the spanking he deserved, but it's not going to change the current government. Uh, in October, the people of Queensland have to make that decision. It's a long way to go yet, uh, and we've certainly seen some changes in the mayoral race. Uh, and, and those who are rock-solid Labor, uh, you know, Jenny Hill and others up in Townsville, and I get on fine with Jenny, looks like they're in trouble, and it comes down to two things, youth crime and housing. Uh, and the Labor government has failed miserably on both. Keith Pitt, great to chat to you as always. Thanks for coming on Outsiders this morning. Great to see you.